And we have a wonderful panel to talk about climate change, which I'm happy to moderate. So we're going to continue right away into the panel. All of the people on the panel are world leaders in the challenge of meeting the goals that we set in Paris. I'll introduce each one as I ask them for a brief introduction. They'll each make an opening uh, response to a question. Uh, we'll have a little bit of interchange and then save your questions for the panel because we'll turn it open for a group discussion uh, after each of the uh, panel members has spoken. So uh, first, I'll turn to uh, Robert Orr, Bob Orr, who is a professor and dean of the School of Public Policy at University of Maryland. Uh, Bob was also, uh, together with me, a senior advisor to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And he, Bob, played a fundamental role in helping us get to the Paris Climate Agreement. And if you watched on December 12, when Laurent Fabius uh, and uh, uh, all of the world leaders uh, came together at the podium, there was Bob also, uh, because uh, I was watching on television. It was very exciting to see you there. Um, and uh, because he played uh, a great uh, diplomatic role at the UN, helping to bring about the agreement. So here we are, uh, we've uh, had just had the second anniversary of the Paris Climate Agreement uh, with uh, a <coughs> meeting that President Macron hosted in Paris uh, last month, or now two months ago, I should say. Um, how are we doing? Is it working? Thank you, Jeff. Um, the Paris Agreement is a very healthy toddler facing a very difficult world. Uh, two years on, uh, this remarkable international agreement uh, faces huge headwinds, but I want to start, before talking about what the challenges are, to talk about what is special about this agreement. The Paris Agreement in 2015 is the first universal agreement among all the governments of the world to address climate change. We had had many efforts before that, but this was the first truly universal agreement. The second unique feature of this agreement is that it was arrived at by governments, but it was arrived at through a process that fully incorporated civil society, universities, businesses, uh, mayors, governors, not just national governments. And I'll come back to that in a minute, because that is one of the sources of its strength. The third unique feature of the Paris Agreement is that it was truly an innovation in international diplomacy. We understood very well that the governments of the world were not prepared to agree to do something that they could not achieve currently, with current capacities. So the agreement was crafted to allow governments to voluntarily submit goals for their own government, essentially meeting those governments where they were in 2015, but at the same time requiring them to agree to goals for the planet that were commensurate with the science and the actual challenge. And it's that hybrid nature of this agreement that we had never seen before. So now I want to move to the challenges. If this was a unique and strong agreement, the first challenge is to achieve the levels of ambition that the science and the planet require. Uh, getting from what governments were willing to do in 2015 to where we have to go is a very, very steep hill. And to achieve that level of ambition, we are going to have to have leadership by individual countries and individual leaders. 
but we will also need to involve virtually every citizen on the planet because we don't just need good policies. We need good individual behavior. We need good consumer behavior. We need activism in the streets. We need universities playing the role that Jeff just described, not just creating knowledge, but then applying it and showing the way. So we need ambition, and in order to get that ambition, we are going to have to support developing countries in some very fundamental ways. Not only are the resources not distributed evenly in the world, but also the institutions that will be required to make the economic transitions stick everywhere. So development assistance, I know, is a long-running issue in this country. Uh, Korea will have to lead, not just here in Korea, but Korea will have to lead globally. And I encourage all of you who are engaged globally, who have traveled abroad and who are thinking in global terms, we need you and we need you here, and we need you out there in the developing world as well. The ambition needs to get us to a world in which we limit the global temperature rise to less than 2 degrees Celsius, and preferably to less than 1.5 degrees. It's a very, very uh, high bar. But we can get there if we mobilize the sectors of the economy to change at a rate that they can change if they are incentivized and mobilized to do so. The second challenge that we have, therefore, is to mobilize the coalitions and remobilize and deepen and broaden the coalitions of actors that unified behind the Paris Agreement. And that's industry by industry, that's sector by sector. That is, the oil and gas companies putting themselves out of business, or more to the point, retooling themselves as energy companies. They can't afford to be oil and gas companies. And the Saudi Arabian Minister of Energy proudly proclaimed to Ban Ki-moon and myself uh, five years ago, I want to be the first minister not of petroleum of my country, but the first minister of energy. It's that mindset that has to sink through entire uh, industries. But it's also big industries, cement, steel, heavy industry that uses so much energy. We need to mobilize them. I don't want to skip past the role of civil society, and in this case, of universities, knowledge institutions. We need to think of ourselves in the universities as a sector. We are little cities. Yonsei University is a city. But you're a very special city. You have to walk the walk in your energy production and consumption, but you need to apply the research you're doing. You need to feed it into the policy process. This is going to require universities to be much more bold than they have been in the past, much more bold, and to put yourself into the public debate. It's not a comfortable place for most academics, so that's where the students have to lead the teachers. Get us out of our comfort zone. Push us into not just the streets, but into the halls of power and into the boardrooms. Um, the second big challenge, in addition to trying to uh, achieve the levels of ambition that were agreed in the uh, Paris Agreement, is to uh, unorphan adaptation and resilience. When we talk about climate change, we immediately start to focus on emissions reductions, which we need to. But we have locked in enough climate change already with the emissions that have already been emitted that we have to adapt. And the places that can least afford that adaptation process are the places that most need it. And so we are at a moment in time where we have to make significant investments. And the climate investments and the other SDG investments are going to have to move together. And here's where we have to be integrated in our thinking about SDGs and about climate change, which is why I love this forum, thinking about all of the SDGs, 
and climate change is an integral part of that process. The third big challenge, and Jeff mentioned this, is finance. Fundamental economic transition takes real money. The good news is there's real money out there to be had, and the, it's being invested every day. We simply have to change the places and the pace at which we are placing new bets on the new economy and not the old economy. In Korea, you understand this. This economy has changed faster than any economy on the face of the planet. You have an expertise in economic transition that is, quite frankly, unparalleled in human history. Be proud of it for about one second and then put it to good use. And this is not just complimenting you because I'm here in Korea and you're Korean. This is because we need you. We need Korea to lead on this, and we need the youth of Korea to lead Korea in that leadership role. The finance equation comes from the people. Yes, the corporate boardrooms and the institutional investors place the money, but they place it against what you buy, they place it against what you call for, what you're mobilized around. And you would be surprised how fickle investors can be. If they think that the market is moving, you are moving in what you are going to consume. Jeff mentioned electric cars. If you decide you're going to invest in electric vehicles, the markets will move, the money will move. So finance is out there it simply needs to be motivated to move to the right places faster. The fourth major challenge is to keep the multi-stakeholder army that was created, that led to the Paris Agreement, we need to keep that army in the field. And I apologize for the bellicose rhetoric, but it is an army. It's an army of average citizens around the world who came out in the streets it is an army of average citizens who are buying things differently than they used to buy. It's an army of conscientious companies that are starting to do things differently and out-competing their rivals because they are doing things differently. We need to motivate and move all of those players uh, into uh, uh, further action. I would close simply by saying that all of this is quite sobering. It's a lot we have to accomplish. But if I could just remind you that in 2009, when the talks collapsed in Copenhagen, Denmark, and everyone said basically the climate process was done, it was over. In six short years, we moved from the valley of despair in Copenhagen to the mountaintop in Paris. Six short years, we went from nobody really supporting a new agreement to every country in the world. If we can do that in six years, and the money is out there, and the will is there, we can achieve what is necessary for this planet and for all the people on it. So please do not despair. Continue the path that Korea has helped us to blaze at the United Nations and apply yourselves here in the university and in your society in a way that will leave this planet to future generations. Thank you. Great. Thank you for a fantastic uh, start and uh, overview of the issues. And now we're going to turn to the Asian uh, context. Asia is 60% uh, of uh, the world's population, the world economy, the world's emissions. Uh, this is, of course, where the future is going to be made. And we could not have a more knowledgeable and authoritative world leader to uh, tell us about the uh, Asian prospects uh, on this than uh, Dr. Shamshad Akhtar. Uh, Shamshad has done everything you can do, and she'll continue to do even more, but she has been governor of the Central Bank of Pakistan. She's been vice president of the World Bank. She's been senior 
uh, advisor to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. She's been Sherpa for the UN uh, to the G20 process. And now she is the Under Secretary General of the UN and Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, the regional body of the United Nations for this uh, center of gravity for the world. So, Shamshad, are we going to make it, and is Asia going to do it? Thank you, Jeff. Um, with you and uh, Bobor uh, leading, it's a tough act to follow. Um, I have to say that, um, first of all, I have to preface uh, my remarks by saying I'm here because of uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and Robert Orr, because they were two critical people who um, uh, got me into the United Nations. I have a multilateral development bank background, uh, not so much into the global governance, uh, because in MDBs, we had a different type of global governance than in United Nations. So that will be my first lesson to you, uh, that there is very different dynamics of global governance at the multilateral development banks and uh, um, at United Nations being a member-led organization. Now, within that context, I sit in a place called UNSCAP, which is United Nations' largest regional commission. And as you heard from Jeff, it is really um, um, a center of Asia Pacific. Um, it is important to upfront lay out what are the challenges. I think climate action is imperative in Asia Pacific, and action in Asia Pacific will drive the agenda critically. CO2 emissions have grown from 28% uh, of global emissions in 1970 to 58% in 2015. Asia's emission intensity is second highest in the world, despite recent improvements. Emissions continue to rise uh, as Asia's share in global GDP and energy demand is somewhere around 50% or so. Um, it will be 50% or so by 2050. So the scenario um, is not looking as perky as it should, really. The cost of inaction, and I know a lot has been written on this topic, are considerable in Asia. Growth and sustainable development will significantly be impacted by climate change. All these goals can only be realized if we have stable. Um, uh, climate environment. Asia Pacific's GDP could decrease by over 3% by 2050 and by 10% by uh, 2100. The cost of acting, in contrast, are relatively modest. Transitioning to a low carbon pathway under a 2 degree scenario is estimated to cost the region between 1.4 to 1.8 percent of GDP by 2050, 2 percent by 2100, as benefits of low emissions are significant. So our dilemma, of course, is that 1 percent increase of per capita income induces a 2.5 percent increase in carbon emissions. So transitioning to low carbon pathway means decoupling economic growth and emissions. I don't think we can distract ourselves from growth as per se, but how do you have a carbon neutral growth is our biggest challenge. So what are we doing? Of course, we have heard the story of the international agreement. But what is Asia Pacific doing? Of course, it is very much um, contributing to the UNFCCC's. All the countries have signed off to the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions and all that. But where is the action? I want to highlight few areas where action is going to happen. And I speak from a platform which was not traditionally uh, allowed to enter into climate change discussions, 
but I think we have managed to penetrate. And we have had now an agreement with private sector in particular, but also with some of our member states, that we would really be working on a regional climate action agenda. So what are the bigger pillars of this? First of all, we have set up an energy intergovernmental committee, and this committee is looking at issues of energy transition in Asia Pacific, and in particular, it is focused on how do you promote energy security and uh, energy connectivity, the point that Jeff made through regional cooperation and integration. We have deficit economies uh, in terms of the hydrocarbon reserves, and then we have, by and large, bulk of our region imports. And obviously, the economics is quite clear. The region has to move towards renewable energy eventually, and in a bigger way. And also, one has to recognize it's not going to happen overnight, because today, the energy mix of our region is very disturbing. We consume over a quarter of the world's oil. We consume uh, energy mix, mix includes 45% of coal. And natural gas composition is about 10%. So in the renewable scene, we obviously have to put in the equation natural gas. And clearly, few things that are happening which are fascinating, which is the LNG and the gas pipelines, which are also helping quite a bit. I'll just give you one example. ASEAN now is catering to, uh, for 66% of the regional demand of uh, uh, LNG. This is going to grow further. And there are also other economies that are reach, sub-regions that are following suit. Region is also has rich hydropower potential, close to 52,000 terawatt hours per annum. It offers transboundary options for energy diversification and sharing. And more recently, CASA 1000, which has involved power sharing in a, in a landscape which was unthinkable between Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Similarly, on the gas side, we have what is famously called a te TEPI project, and there will be gas transmission uh, from uh, Iran to Pakistan and India. These transactions are no small transaction. They will play their role, and there will be more of these kinds. A second point I'd like to shift to is energy efficiency. I think this is being promoted by, of course, changes in regulatory standards, fiscal incentives, so and so forth. Just pick two examples. China and India, the largest uh, emitters, have set mandatory energy intensity targets covering 85 and 40% respectively of their industry cons uh, consumption. Let me move to a third point, which is uh, regarding market mechanism that Jeff talked about. I think the best mechanism is really the carbon pricing mechanism. And fortunately, it is gaining momentum in our region. 12 of the 18 emissions trading systems currently enforced globally are in Asia Pacific. China's National Emission Trading Center system, which has been established in December 2017, laid the groundwork for the creation of the world's largest carbon market. South Korea, I'm sure you know, has launched its national ETS in January 2015, which will cover over two-thirds of its emissions. Japan has two subnational and link scheme, the Tokyo and Sayatama ETS, which together cover about two-fifths of the emissions. And I can go on, but let me give another example, Singapore. Singapore, I just met the Permanent Secretary of Environment, and obviously they are contemplating carbon tax in 2019. And I can go on with more examples, but in interest of time, let me move to the financing, my favorite topic. <laughs> 
we all know and we have heard from both the speakers that money is not an issue. There is plenty of resources available. What is a problem, however, is domestic resource mobilization and the concept of what we would call um, the syntax or the carbon pricing mechanisms. And there is need to, of course, work at the national level to, of course, mobilize more national resources because in order to leverage private finance through credit enhancement, mitigation measures, um, also risk mechanisms, you do need to put in um, upfront some capital to leverage private finance. You have to also be prepared to accommodate the risk, the political risk, the country risk, the exchange risk, and you need the whole array of the instruments that as finance uh, people we all are used to. Now, it's only when I came into United Nations that I was confronted with this issue that climate finance is one strand and development finance is another. Now, obviously, with, with no disrespect to United Nations, because uh, I'm still on their paycheck, it's important, <laughs> to, it's important to recognize that as a finance person, I see finance as finance. And whether you are going to be using finance for PPP project or you'll use finance for climate finance, uh, you would still need the same array of instruments. So I think it's important to uh, recognize that bulk of the financing is going to come from private finance because public finances are rather limited. I mean, if you look at some of the economies of Asia, the average tax GDP ratio is hardly 17.3%. Um, on an average, with some countries uh, even below 10% or around 10% of GDP. So I believe we'll have to go um, and solicit financing from private sector. So what's been, uh, what are the two, three interesting things that we can think of? The most obvious that was contemplated in the G20 was to um, slash the fuel subsidies. Uh, now, unfortunately, it hasn't happened fully, but there is substantial amount of money out there still. Uh, I think uh, according to the estimates in, in Asia itself, um, the subsidies in Asia account for over one third of global energy subsidies. Fiscal gains from phase out of subsidies are estimated to be 10% of the region's GDP. So that's one very obvious source of revenue we have. The second is, you know, uh, being a central bank governor, I really think financial intermediation has to deliver. So what would make a change is if the central banking industry, the securities market regulators, had a completely different mindset. Fortunately, China in 2016 issued guidelines for establishing the green financial system. Indonesia's OJK has issued regulation on sustainable finance in July 2017. So it's happening in the central banks. Similarly, securities markets are also looking at the governance uh, of the climate finance. And I think it's important to make the investors understand the premium that climate finance can bring, which is not the financial premium, but the societal premium that has been talked about thus far. The other is really the way the green bonds uh, are being issued in our region. Over two-fifths of the global total um, has been raised within our region uh, of Asia-Pacific. Asia-Pacific countries, four of them, are now among the global top 10 climate-aligned bond countries. China, of course, stands out, account accounting for 82% of the total in the region. So I, I do believe uh, there are interesting things that are happening out there. There is, of course, this whole massive industry of blended finance, uh, and there are so many innovative risk mitigation um, mechanisms, tools, instruments that we could draw on. Um, I have to say that uh, I am very optimistic that Asia Pacific will bring in the change on climate change because the fulcrum of the global governance uh, and multilateralism is moving from west to east in Asia. And um, it is going to drive the climate agenda. 
energy transition, given that we are such large consumers, forecasts are continuing to be, people have realized that welfare, public welfare is very important, health costs have gone up. So there is an increased understanding among the policy makers. The political commitment is getting stronger in Asia from the interviews I've had with the leaders and the ministers. The dilemma is, of course, the vested interest, which Jeff talked about and captured. And I have to tell you, and I'll end at that, that I was recently invited to speak at the Asia Energy Transition Forum. And of course, we had Gulf ministers out there. And I wouldn't name the country, it's all minister. But after all that I said about energy transition, um, the remark was oil industry is here to stay, which is okay. Nobody is contesting that, but it is growing, going to grow fast, and oil prices will come back, and we shall be able to invest in the. Nobody is thinking about the stranded assets. I stop here. Thank you, Jeff. I'm on my way to the Middle East from here, so I will remind them. Uh, no, not, not, not what they said, but uh, remind them about their commitments under the Paris Climate Agreement. I don't think oil's here to stay, actually. I mean, it's going to stay underground. <laughs> That's where it has to stay. It's, it's so wonderful and valuable, we should just keep it underground. Leave it there. Uh, and uh, we can come visit it, even. You could take tours to your favorite oil reserve. Uh, but uh, that's where it, it really belongs. We're very lucky uh, to have uh, one, of, one of Korea's leaders uh, in this effort, uh, uh, former environment minister, Yoo young Soo. Uh, and uh, if I uh, understand correctly, you're a PhD in biochemistry. And uh, so a, a scientist, you were vice president of life, scientist, life sciences at KIST. Uh, Minister of Environment, so you've seen it from the academic and the scientific side. You've seen it from the political side. Tell us uh, how Korea is doing and what, what it needs to do. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Jeffrey and Robert to give an uh, encouraging message to our young generations of Korea. You should have a pride as being a Korean. Also need to have a responsibility to the world. Okay, first of all, I'd like to uh, express my sincere thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me to this wonderful forum. It is my uh, privilege and great pleasure to participate in this wonderful forum, especially this uh, plenary session of climate action. As one of a global citizen myself, it is an honor for me to participate uh, to this inaugural event of GEEF-SD. As Jeffrey mentioned earlier in his uh, plenary, and Mr. Ban Ki-moon mentioned by himself many times that his most important legacy were SDGs in Paris Agreement. This plenary session, uh, which I participate in, in is more meaningful because it is the very session that uh, deal with the climate change and SDGs. As most of you know well, that the year of 2015, as Robert mentioned, one of the greatest year in the history of humankind. Both the Paris Agreement and SDGs were adopted by the countries and formed the fundamental basis uh, for peace and prosperity of Earth. Both the Paris Agreement and SDGs place their emphasis on implementation. Here I'd like to share uh, the Korean experience, including energy, renewable energy policy, of how we can better achieve those lofty goals. During my tenure, as a Minister of Environment of Republic of Korea, I had the privilege of making a contribution in formulating uh, lots of government policies regarding the climate change 
and sustainable development. During my service from 2011 to early 2013, I had numerous opportunities uh, to participate in both domestic and international discussions. The theme was on how a new development paradigm to effectively address climate change while achieving sound economic growth uh, and environmental sustainability. We call the new development paradigm as a low carbon green growth in Korea. Since Korea's initiative on low carbon green growth uh, took off, many governments and international organizations took a strategic priority to adopt and practice green economy. The international community recognized the importance of green economy as a powerful tool for achieving sustainable development and poverty eradication uh, in Rio Plus 20 summit meeting in 2012. The most important element for the successful and effective uh, implement, implementation of both the Paris Agreement and SDGs as well as low carbon green growth policy is, I think, to build and maintain strong political will and leadership at the highest level. In the Republic of Korea's case, when we announced the, our low carbon green growth policy in 2008, it was Lee Myung-bak, the president of the time. President Lee showed great interest in tackling climate change and using it as another potential uh, engine for, in, for national growth. To support the, his political interest, the Presidential uh, Committee on Green Growth was established and played a central role in uh, terms of policy coordination and implementation as well. Dr. Yang Sugil in the floor was the former uh, president of the Presidential Committee. At the policy level, Korea successfully created its own policy of low carbon green growth. Uh, this policy not only covered uh, issues relating to the Ministry of Environment, but also issues of relevance to most other ministries as well. At that time, uh, key ministers include the Ministry of Environment, of course, the Ministry of Knowledge Economy, uh, which was the Ministry of Energy at the time, the Ministry of Land Infrastructure, Transportation, the Ministry of Finance, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and so on. In terms of the conceptual framework regarding the implementation of low carbon green growth, the, globe, the goal was to develop the so-called Green Triangle. Uh, Global Green Growth Institute, GGGI, for policy, and Green Climate Fund for GCF, for funds. And I'm very glad uh, to see the heads of two, those two organizations, GGGI and GCF, uh, two main pillars of, of the Green Triangle here today. I'd like to uh, briefly introduce the work of Green Technology Center, GTC, uh, which is the last piece of Green Triangle. As we all know, science, technology, and innovation have a great power to shape our society. And it is a critical uh, means in achieving low carbon green growth as well as uh, sustainable development. Green Technology Center supports international coordination and cooperation and R&D policy development in green technology. This unique example of Korean experience may well be relevant to other countries regarding how to develop efficient SDGs implementation scheme. And I hope that uh, this green triangle will also help uh, realize inclusive green economy 
thereby contributing many SDGs, for example, uh, Goal 13 for climate change, Goal 7 for energy, and Goal 8 for economic growth. Now, let me continue to uh, mention about the energy policy in Korea. To counteract the climate change while providing a sufficient energy to meet the basic human need, uh, having more reliance on renewable energy is essential. During the la uh, last government, Lee myung government, the Korean government started to enact strong targets uh, to promote the use of renewable, renewable energies. And as you may know, that Korea has set a target in its NDCs, uh, nationally determined contribution, uh, to reduce 37% of the country's greenhouse gas emissions compared to BAU, uh, by 2030. To achieve this um, goal, new government of Korea established the plan of renewable energy 3020 in last November. Ambition, ambitious goal and plans are set to increase the shares of renewable energy uh, in the energy production mix up to 20% by 2030. About 100 trillion Korean won, including 18 trillion government funds, will be invested uh, to uh, renewable energy production. Let me tell you briefly that how ambitious this plan is. We need to increase the portion of renewable energy from 7% in 2016 to 20% in 2030. It means that the maximum renewable energy capacity needs to be uh, expanded from 13.3 gigawatt to 63.8 gigawatt. Nuclear energy and coal, uh, coal power plant will be uh, significantly reduced accordingly. The Korean government is taking uh, a two-track approach in implementing this ambitious renewable uh, energy 3020 plans. First, many big scale projects have been actively led by public private sector, such as a solar power on water, uh, offshore wind power. Another track is community based approach. Government promotes active participation of citizens. As you may know, the Climate Change Center, uh, which I'm currently working for, is one of the biggest. A Korean NGO in the rel uh, relevant field. Uh, as a representative of the civil society now, I'd like to welcome this new and innovative uh, approaches by the government. I'd like to share a couple of examples uh, that are being already implemented by the civil society and community-based activities. The Climate Change Center is carrying out projects to install biogas storehouses and clean stove facilities in Cambodia and Nepal. Since Korean government wants to promote the participation of citizens further by providing incentives uh, for community-based projects, many citizens are now participating the initiative of uh, reducing one ton of CO2 per every citizen. This initiative is led by our Climate Change Center and other civil society. I believe this uh, civil society and community-based uh, projects will contribute to uh, various SDGs. I can say energy, uh, sustainable community, sustainable consumption and production, climate change, as well as a partnership. Before I close my remarks, uh, I'd better add one more very important uh, policy implemented in Korea, that is Emission Trading Scheme, ETS. Starting from January 1st of 2015, uh, we introduced ETS at the national level. Uh, despite the resistance, as you can imagine, uh, guidelines were ultimately set 
the major emitting companies started to reducing uh, their greenhouse gas emissions in order to comply with the targets. These companies also started to uh, be active in introducing various low carbon technologies, for example, to development and installation of solar panels as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for very uh, detailed and very, very interesting uh, report on, uh, on uh, the situation in Korea. Now we're going to uh, turn to uh, the uh, person who heads the, the main financing uh, agency established under the UN Framework Convention and the Paris Climate Agreement. So Howard Bamsey is executive director of the Green Climate Fund. Of course, uh, the Green Climate Fund is uh, based in Korea uh, and uh, hosted here. I was very happy to speak to the board a few years ago to urge that it be uh, housed in Korea. Uh, and uh, I think uh, there was a, a good sentiment that uh, this would give a real opportunity for Korean leadership. Uh, Howard Bamsey has been part of this uh, diplomatic process uh, for a long time as a very senior and distinguished member of the Australian Foreign Service uh, and then and a negotiator over climate and in that capacity also heading various UN uh, intergovernmental uh, negotiations. Uh, he became uh, the director general of another Korea-based uh, global organization, the Global Green Growth uh, um, Institute, and we're going to turn to uh, the new director general of that shortly, but uh, Howard played that role for a couple of years, and then uh, after the Paris Climate Agreement uh, became the second executive director of the Green Climate Fund. The need for the Green Climate Fund is huge, the ambition for it is huge, and it's really a great uh, time to get an update of how it stands, how you're doing, what you need, uh, what you would like the world to do uh, as partner with the Green Climate Fund. Howard. Thanks very much, Jeff, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, I want to be optimistic about the prospects for dealing with climate change, for fixing the problem. But before being optimistic, I want to go with Bob uh, back to the wreckage of the Copenhagen Conference of Parties in 2009. Although the conference fell apart, there in the wreckage were a number of gems still glittering that were salvaged. And one of them, really vital one, was a commitment by the developed world to mobilize by 2020 $100 billion a year for climate action in the developing world. And the Green Climate Fund was born when that commitment was reconfirmed formally uh, later in the negotiating process. Now, we're part of that commitment. We embody that commitment but we have only a, a small fraction of the $100 billion a year. We have a total of $10 billion to use. So how do we use those $10 billion to try to deal with this great, giant global problem of climate change? What we have to do is use those billions to find the trillions that Bob referred to earlier. There are trillions. These days, they're sitting around doing not very much at all in some cases, but in many cases, they're doing the wrong thing. They're helping keep fossil fuels in motion. What we've got to do in the Green Climate Fund is use those small resources we have, those few billions we have, to change the pattern of investment of the trillions all around the world so that those trillions are producing the sort of climate action which will see us succeed in defeating the problem. 
How are we going to do that? Well, Jeff, in his introductory speech, gave us a very fine prescription for changing the global economy. Interventions are required to change the fundamentals. And although I was really looking for something, Jeff, to disagree with, um, uh, I certainly can't disagree with that proposition. We need those changes. But meanwhile, we have a job to do in trying to move simply the investment patterns that we see today. And what we can try to do, in fact, is use the system, is use the profit motive to turn investment from the places we don't want it to the places we do want it uh, to fix the climate problem. Now, you wanted governments to act, Jeff, and, and so do we need them even now. They're not off the hook because we're going to use the profit motive. We want governments to act so that the things we want done now, the climate action we need now, becomes profitable. If it's not profitable now, then change the law and governance arrangements, the incentives that governments can provide. Change those so that the incentives are for climate action and not for inaction or even retrograde action. If the framework is set, the investment framework is set by a government, as Minister Yu described, the Korean government did, to stimulate technology development where we need it, to stimulate deployment of new climate-friendly technologies where we need them, then we can achieve success. And indeed, we have achieved great success around the world. In the last few years, the cost of deployed solar technology has crashed by 80%, and astonishingly, we now expect it to reduce by 50% in the next two years. When I was in charge of the Australian Domestic Climate Change Office, we priced solar power at about $80 a kilowatt hour. The last contract I saw for deployment of solar technology in Mexico had it at 1.75 cents per kilowatt hour. That's astonishing. Nobody in this room or any other room predicted that sort of change. So in that change, I think there's hope that if we get the framework right, the investment framework right, we can cause the same sort of cost reductions in other technologies. We're beginning to see now the curve sharpening for storage, electricity storage. We just need a few increments and suddenly the game changes fundamentally again. So I'm hopeful that if governments act to, to get the, the, the framework for investment uh, to, rewarding the sorts of actions they need, then we'll see those actions occur. But there are many gaps. Even though solar is now mainstream and you don't really need incentives, in, most, in many places in the world, it's easily the cheapest form of electricity. Even though it's gone mainstream with dazzling rapidity, there are still many gaps. There are still many challenges, particularly with adaptation to the impacts of climate change we've experienced already and that are inevitable whatever mitigation actions we take tomorrow. So there is a, still a crying need for the sort of investment that the Green Climate Fund can provide. Our role is to get inside the frameworks that we have to encourage governments to continue to change the settings, the incentives for investment, but meanwhile to try to reduce the risk for those who need profit to make investments so that if we do it in a strategic way, if we look for the potential for real transformation in economies to a low carbon, 
climate resilient pathway, if we make those investments strategically, then we can see those billions starting to turn into trillions in places where previously they would not have been invested at all. Let me give you an example. In uh, East Africa, there was a crying need for energy access beyond the grid. There was no way that grids could be built quickly enough uh, or cheaply enough to bring electricity to millions of people who are missing out on it. So along came to us um, with support from the governments they were representing, a venture capital firm based in New York uh, who said, if you invest $25 million, not a lot of money, $25 million as equity, we can start a new market in renewable technology in East Africa. More than that, we can make sure that women are given opportunities to participate fully in, these new, in this new market, in these new investments. And just uh, two years later, we now have that project transforming the lives of hundreds of thousands of people already in East Africa. Because what we were able to do was provide enough capital to attract other capital. Capital that was leery of risk suddenly saw that it was possible to make profitable investments. And we now have a whole new uh, uh, market of uh, people who uh, are still looking for profits, but they're looking for profits in the right places uh, to bring low emissions, zero emissions, uh, energy access to people who didn't have it, displacing biomass and all of the health impacts that that brings. This is just one example of the sort of progress which we are beginning to make in the Green Climate Fund. Our board has now committed about $2.7 billion in projects, and we're pushing very hard to see those implemented. Some of them have time lines of up to 20 years, but already we're uh, implementing uh, about almost a billion dollars worth of those projects. Uh, so we are beginning to make the sort of difference that I mentioned earlier we had to make. We are beginning to leverage other investments. We are beginning to make possible private at-risk investments in areas of the world and in areas of activity where they were not possible before. If we're going to continue in the longer term to do that, we have to produce new financial instruments. We have to measure our risk more precisely than we can. We're going to need continuing innovation. That's what we in the Green Climate Fund need more than anything else. We need people who can come to us and think of new ways of running our system, new ways of providing access to finance that haven't existed before to meet the new challenges of this climate response. In doing that, we're going to depend on universities, just as we do now. We're going to depend on Yonsei University, and I hope that some of you listening now who are students or new graduates will think about the Green Climate Fund. There are very few places in where you can be sure that if you are employed and are contributing, you do have the prospect of changing the world. So please think about the Green Climate Fund. We're not far away at Songdo. Um, and, uh, and in any case, uh, use the opportunity you have, the strength of innovation that universities produce to help all of us meet this climate challenge and meet it positively and optimistically. Thanks, Jim. Okay, you heard, get your CVs ready, right? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, 
have an, another uh, leader of uh, this country, a wonderful uh, diplomat, uh, a renowned diplomat that I had uh, also the enormous uh, joy to uh, work with uh, when he was ambassador uh, to the United Nations uh, and also president of uh, ECOSOC, uh, the uh, <coughs> social and <coughs> economic chamber of the United Nations, which is a, <coughs> excuse me, a very important position and a very prestigious one and uh, obviously given to Ambassador Ojun because of uh, the very high esteem that uh, his uh, uh, counterparts uh, at the United Nations uh, uh, held. So you've been uh, seeing all of this diplomatic process uh, from uh, a very uh, great leadership position uh, also inside the UN Security Council, uh, where you represented Korea. Uh, give us your perspective on where we are and what we need to do. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's great to see you in Korea. Um, but to be sure, uh, climate action is a political issue. Um, like, um, like, like a free trade issue, which is uh, originally an economic issue, but is also on a political issue. If you think about it, when you go for free trade, in our society, there are segments that are gaining more from free trade, and other segments that are losing more. But usually, the winners are not particularly conscious of this, or they just think they are doing well because they are good, or they don't want to talk about it. But losers, they start to complain very quickly. And politicians listen. So this becomes a political issue. A lot of times we make decisions that are not very rational, that are more um, based more on short-term consideration rather than long-term and collective benefits. That's our reality. And the same thing can happen to climate action. Um, when you go for carbon emission reduction, you know, in our society, in our economy, there are industries that are uh, getting more negative impacts from them than others. Then, you know, they start to make noise, which resound very loudly to politicians. You know, you pointed out in your initial statement. But this analogy, in a way, entails a great deal of danger because in the case of free trade, we might be able to learn lessons. We might have a chance to redeem ourselves by learning from mistakes. But in the case of climate change, we might not have a second chance. It's a very dangerous game to play. And if we apply the same, same rules of game or same dynamic, political dynamics where, you know, uh, short-term short political considerations prevail over long-term uh, collective benefits, then we are in big trouble. And, and we see a lot of it. Um, so the, it, this is a is, political issue both domestically and at the international level. At the international level, um, you know, right now it looks like that uh, we have a big uh, issue, uh, which is uh, uh, the United States withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. But uh, if you think about it, um, even if the U.S. withdraws from the Paris Agreement, um, I don't think the United States as a country will divert from its uh, mitigation or adaptation duties uh, greatly. You know, President Trump said uh, when he announced uh, the withdrawal, he said, I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. Probably he misunderstood that Paris Agreement was adopted by Parisians. 
But anyway, anyway, um, even though he said that, I don't think someone in Brooklyn will reconsider her plan to purchase an electric car because the United States is withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. So life will go on. I think a uh, lot of people, at the level of people, or le at the level of uh, state governments, they will go ahead with their plans and efforts to reduce carbon emissions. But the U.S. withdrawal presents um, another, uh, a big problem at another level because we will probably not be able to see uh, climate leadership as we have seen, uh, for example, during the Obama administration, you know, United States coming out of its way to pressure other countries, to encourage other countries to come along, you know, to be more forthcoming, which was very important, which will continue to be important. So when the U.S. is not playing that kind of a role, who's going to do that? It's a critical question for the whole world. Maybe Europe, because Europe, the EU was, uh, um, you know, we, we only talk about uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and President Obama when it comes to Paris Agreement, but actually, you know, even though they played a great role, actually Europeans were there in the first place, you know. Those who are, are involved in this know that. So I think the Europeans will play, uh, can play a leadership role in climate action. Maybe China, you know, China is coming along and President Xi Jinping said that, you know, China will do everything. Um, you know, he kind of, uh, uh, in a way, criticized the U.S. withdrawal, uh, not very directly, but he indicated that, and he promised China's strength and role in, in climate action. Maybe the United Nations, you know, I know that uh, Secretary General Guterres has a plan to hold an important meeting on climate action this year, so we can, you know, look forward to continued role by the United Nations as well. I will stop here. Thank you. Sorry, when President Trump made that statement, uh, I was elected to represent Pittsburgh, not Paris. Immediately, the mayor of Pittsburgh and the mayor of Paris wrote an article together uh, saying, you're not representing either of us. <laughs> Uh, and uh, actually uh, announcing in the article that Pittsburgh would be 100 percent renewable by 2035. Here's what I found on the web. Oh. Uh, and that's Siri telling me about the uh, Pittsburgh, uh, about Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> and actually, Pittsburgh was the home of our big steel industry, and it was very dirty, very polluted, uh, tremendous amount of uh, lung disease. And then it made the transition to being a leading high-tech uh, city with uh, Carnegie Mellon University as the hub of artificial intelligence, so one of the great robotics uh, universities in the world. And it now has autonomous driving, and it's pioneering uh, self-driving electric vehicles, and it's clean air, and, uh, uh, and they, vote, they did not vote for Mr. Trump. Uh, and, and they won't uh, either. So it's good news, actually. We don't know who he was elected to represent. We're trying to figure that out. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't Pittsburgh. Uh, the, the, uh, one, of, one of the issues about climate change is <clears throat> that it's so interconnected with not only energy, but also agriculture, uh, food supply, uh, water, and uh, you need a very holistic understanding of these issues, and our last speaker on the panel is uh, truly exemplifies that uh, kind of holistic experience and uh, perspective, because uh, Frank uh, Riesperman, who is now Director General of uh, the Global Green Growth Institute that uh, Howard uh, Bamsey had been head of uh, uh, three years ago, uh, Frank has been leader on many of the different aspects of sustainable development at a very high international level. 
So he was, uh, before this task of GGGI, uh, he was head of CEO of the CGIAR, the Consultative Group for International Agriculture Research, which is 14 global research institutes that are central to the technology challenge and uh, systems challenge of global agriculture. Uh, before that, he was director general of uh, one of those CGIAR units, the uh, International Water Management Institute, which looks at the water dimension. In between uh, all of that, he's been at uh, Google, he's been at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, he's trained as a civil engineer, so you have all the answers, Frank. Uh, and you're the uh, wrap-up of uh, this panel, so please uh, give us the perspective, not only from GGGI, but definitely from your, uh, the, the institute uh, that you lead right now, uh, but also your perspective uh, bringing in the agriculture side, uh, food, water as well. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Thank you also other speakers for having said most of what I would have said. I think you had very insightful contributions. But I wanted to come back to one of the very first sentences that uh, Jeff came up with, and that was that the current system of economic development doesn't automatically produce the sustainable development goals or the nationally determined contributions for the Paris Agreement to make all that happen. We do need some conscious change in our economic approach. Indeed, green growth, Green Growth Institute, uh, and you heard from the Minister of Environment already the, the history of that idea of green growth in, in Korea was very much trying to embody that, that we need a different approach to the economy. Some people in Korea believe that that was a Korean idea, but I think actually it was a Korean idea that was very much part of what the world was doing at the time. It was the theme of the Rio Plus 20 meeting, if you like. And in a way, while you know green growth is not the most popular term right now, we've used sustainable development more a little bit here, given that government changed and so on. I don't think that matters that much. In a way, green growth was already sustainable development reinvented. You know, for most of my own career, since I uh, read a book, when people still did that in the previous century, uh, Mrs. Brundtland's committee's book, uh, Our Common Future, which if not invented and at least popularized the idea of sustainable development, the idea of sustainable development was exactly the same, that you could have economic growth that was also sustainable. And indeed, I've been a uh, sustainable development professional for pretty much all my uh, career. I guess a bit more in the grassroots than the kind of global systems that we've been discussing here. So I'd like to also maybe add a bit to the discussion by giving a bit more national examples of why things uh, don't always go ahead the way we are discussing here. But first let me say that uh, when I was asked to join GDGI, I did think, so what is the difference between green growth and sustainable development? And initially, as an academic, if you like, I thought there was no difference, that the ideas are essentially identical. But I have to say, traveling the world and meeting our member institutes, and particularly meeting ministers of finance, I think there's a little difference. As a sustainable development professional, we were usually associated with the Ministry of the Environment and trying to get to the Ministry of Finance. And the Minister of Finance generally had no time for us. Economic growth was more important. We need to help our people out of poverty and we'll deal with the environment later. I think that idea is truly buried. You know, we are finding out, including in countries like Korea, as already others have said, probably the most successful example of very rapid economic growth in the world that many other developing countries are very jealous of or trying to follow, you know, what is the problem you worry about most? 
I don't know what you worry about most. I can tell you, my wife, we live here. What she worries about most is the fine dust problem. The air pollution that has come hand in hand with economic growth. And that's so throughout Asia. In fact, many people tell me, oh, it's not so bad here. You know, we come from Delhi, it's worse there. Or we come from Beijing, it's much worse there. Ulaanbaatar, very bad. Everywhere throughout Asia, this powerhouse of economic growth for the last couple of decades, people live with incredible negative consequences. Maybe in Seoul it's not so bad. But it's bad enough that, you know, one of my son's soccer tournaments was canceled because of air quality. Every morning, my son's school's nurse checks whether the kids can play outside. I think that's pretty bad. In fact, what might be worse is that uh, at least here you are aware of it, and indeed, government is trying to address it. When we had a red air day, the mayor made you know, public transportation uh, free. Shortly after that, I traveled to Hanoi, to Vietnam. Uh, I landed there, and I talked about the bad air here. And people there were like, okay, wow, that's really bad. And I said, you don't seem to have a problem with air pollution. And in fact, we were pulling our phone out. We all have air visual on our phone, right? or something like that. Turned out air pollution in Hanoi was worse than Seoul. But people don't even know about it. So I guess we are ahead here in Seoul because the people are aware, government is beginning to do things about it. In places like Hanoi and Vietnam, they have the same problem, they're not aware yet. And the government is still enthusiastically saying they need to build coal-fired power plants because the economy needs it to grow. So there we are, you know, for a long time we were playing the moral card. We were saying you have to do renewable energy because it's better for the environment, because of climate change and so on. The good news is that has recently changed. As a few of other, you know, Howard has already said, solar energy is now cheaper than coal. But when I sit with the Minister of Planning of Indonesia and tell him that, you can see that he doesn't really believe you. And he tells me all these arguments that other people have told me told him you know Indonesia doesn't have that much renewable energy or you know we don't have enough land to put these things sound familiar those arguments I hear those same arguments in the current discussion about the increased uh, target for renewable energy here in Korea so it's not that easy to get agreement on the ground on what the acceptable solutions for society are, even though the overall economics point in the right direction. There are good examples. Some of the other member organizations uh, of GGI are Germany, for instance, or the UK. And in Germany, they've gone through this, what they call the Energiewende, the energy transition. There they decided that they wanted to get rid of uh, nuclear energy after uh, the accident in Japan. So they did, they rapidly ramped down nuclear energy and they put in place renewable energy. Uh, but there is indeed a price. You know, one of the strongest uh, German power companies that before not too long was sort of going around Europe buying up other power companies like crazy. The last summer they lost, I think it was $8 billion because they're no longer, you know, a big profitable company because renewable energy is eating their lunch. So there is a price to pay. And of course, that is, discussing, that is influencing the discussion here in, in Korea as well. As I think at those Shamshat was saying, there are incumbents, there are stranded assets, uh, and you have to be pretty strong to push through that. In the UK, they haven't decided to give up the nuclear energy, like France, they're a bit more married to nuclear energy, but they decided to get rid of coal very quickly, much more rapidly than you are considering here. Uh, a good 10 years ago, they said, okay, no more new coal-fired power plants. At that time, they had something like 49% of their energy coming from coal. Now it's gone straight down to some 9%. That did worry people. There were big discussions on energy security at the time, but they found out that actually offshore wind energy is cheaper than their coal, so they don't worry as much now. So I think it's all those sort of nitty-gritty national discussions that we have to be aware of 
either whether the incumbents are worried of losing their cash or whether the government might have the right idea but not the right policy. You know, we speak with companies like uh, Hanva Q Cells, a, a major renewable energy company, solar cell producer from Korea, and they have a big pipeline of projects, but their projects are in the US, in Japan, India. They're interested in places like Cambodia or maybe the Pacific Islands, but they're quite scared, frankly. There are big risks there. So yes, yeah, so that is where organizations like Howard's or the ADB and others can help bring uh, those investments to the right places, or at least be the first investment so that maybe it becomes easier. Well, in fact, the economics, particularly in places that need it most, like the Pacific Islands, they currently pay a very high price for their energy because their alternative is diesel. So when you pay 40, 50 cents per kilowatt hour for diesel, it's actually dead easy. Even solar plus batteries is competitive. So we are an organization that helps governments see those alternatives. We help put in place policies and we help them prepare the good projects that then are bankable and can get the investments uh, from organizations like Howard's. When these are small scale, like in Fiji, uh, we can do the technical feasibility study that solar and batteries are indeed cheaper than diesel, but it's too small a scale. The private investors won't come out of bed for a couple of millions. So indeed we need COICA in that case to write a letter of guarantee and they will, haven't yet decided, but are very likely to then provide a grant. But in Indonesia, for instance, in very similar small islands, when we can put eight of those together and make it into a package and it becomes $15 million, in that case, we didn't even need the Green Climate Fund. We could get a commercial investor to underwrite such a project straight away. So that is sort of the nitty gritty in Asia, if you like. I actually think in Africa it's more optimistic. It's a bit more like Howard was saying. They don't have, you know, the, the bad thing is people don't have access to energy. The good thing is they don't have the incumbents or the stranded assets. So they could potentially leapfrog. And that's where the inclusive side to uh, growth also comes in. So there, indeed, the same things that are good for the Paris Agreement are also good for increasing energy access, you know, the energy that allows kids to school, to go to study at home, or, or get, indeed, maybe public transport to go to school and so on. All kinds of good development that we've been trying in a more centralized ways for years and we're never able to bring to the countryside is possible if we have this different, this more green growth idea to development and if we are able to, to finance it differently. So I think I'm an optimistic person. You have to be if you want to work in this field for a long time. But I see a lot of very good uh, reason to be an optimist, although there are challenges. There is a lot of, you know, it's slow. A lot of people don't know. There's a lot of pushback from the incumbents. But the bottom line, I think, is like uh, Howard, I met uh, a man called Tony Siba recently, who was very good at looking a little bit further into the future than most of us do. Most of us, what we say about tomorrow is very influenced by yesterday, what we experienced the last few years. Tony Siba and other people think maybe 10 years ahead. And he sees a world indeed where, you know, combustible uh, engines for cars are just no longer profitable and batteries become so cheap that it's indeed electric cars that are autonomous and that you don't own but that you get through an Uber type model. So transport as a service, that would very much change not just uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, but it would change how you organize your cities because suddenly you don't need as many cars. So those traffic jams that we have so many of here in Seoul, no more traffic jams. Parking, no longer a problem. So you can start to think about reorganizing your cities. So I think indeed, we're talking about climate change here this afternoon, and indeed greenhouse gas emissions and energy is driving a lot of this, but the implications are great for many of the other sustainable development goals for reorganizing life in a way that is uh, much more sustainable and indeed inclusive. So yes, I'm optimistic. So I hope I gave you that bit of overall perspective, Jeff, you asked for. Thank you. Let's uh, turn it to you uh, for questions or brief comments. Does somebody have a microphone uh, 
where is the mic? Here. Okay, where are, where are the questions? Raise your hands. Well, uh, thank you all for coming here today to Korea and giving us these great presentations addressing sustainable development and the climate change. Uh, my name is Zaki Wael and I'm representing the Embassy of Kuwait. And um, what I just want to emphasize that uh, in the Middle East, uh, there is kind of a gap uh, uh, considering the public awareness we, with the climate change issues. And also when we talk about taking actions uh, cutting the sub subsidi subsidi decision of uh, fuel. Uh, in some countries, in, the, in developing countries, some countries are not ready yet for that. The public are still having a lot on their, on their shoulders and they are not ready for what can happen if we cut the subsidization of fuel. Uh, of, it, might re it might result in social unrest. So my question is how can we manage that we make the transition to renewable energy, but without having a great big cost on the public sector? Thank you. Who wants to take that on? I wanted to uh, start by expressing uh, great appreciation for the, the challenge for governments that uh, uh, do depend heavily on fossil fuels. The transition is not easy. Uh, but the beauty of being fossil fuel rich is that countries like Kuwait have the assets to make the transition faster than anybody else. Um, so while it is true that sequencing and handling uh, termination of subsidies or at least scaling down of subsidies uh, is challenging, uh, the fact is uh, you have the assets to be able to make the transition and be highly competitive in new energy markets. Um, uh, a country like Kuwait not only has great uh, fossil fuel assets, you also have great solar assets. <laughs> um, and the fact that uh, I've seen some of the, the new uh, power plants being built in uh, your region and the uh, the uh, cost per kilowatt hour there is shockingly low. Um, and so I think it, it is, uh, you are able to be competitive in a very uh, quick turnaround if you use your, your capital from the fossil fuel uh, uh, sources to make that transition faster. I think one thing that's a common theme of, uh, one thing that is a common theme is that you need a plan because this is a long-term investment. Each country has to assess what its uh, renewable assets are, what its links with its neighbors are, what's on grid, what's off grid. Markets will not sort this out. They can't by themselves, even with the carbon price, by the way, because you have to make basic decisions what about nuclear energy, yes or no? What about land use? What about uh, transmission rights? So these are, these are choices and strategies. And the one thing that I, I don't think comes through enough that I want everybody to keep in mind is that we're out of time. So everything is good going in the right direction, but if it goes too slowly, you just go over the cliff slowly but you still go over the cliff. In other words, we really need to move. And if we want to achieve what we said in Paris, and we better achieve that, by 2050, we have to be out of the fossil fuel business. And the problem is, even if the trend is in the right direction, it's by sure not at the pace that's needed right now. So we have to really pick up the pace, and that requires that vision of where we want to be basic fundamental change and facing down those who don't believe it because it's inconvenient for them to believe it. 
ExxonMobil was pushed by its shareholders to give a report recently. It just published it a couple of days ago. It's in advance, at least. It talks about two-degree scenario and what they're going to do. But the numbers are all bogus because they haven't gotten to the hard truth yet that they have to go out of business as an oil and gas company, and they have to become, as Bob said, an energy company, but for wind or solar or other things. And so the, the timing is part of this also that's really important. Who's got the mic? Can I? Uh, Jeff? Jeff, can I add something? Um, well, I like to emphasize the importance of inclusion in, in decision making and also in climate dialogues. You know, when you are undertaking such uh, far reaching uh, efforts as uh, energy transition, you know, you need to engage a lot of people. You need to try to uh, persuade people, you know, for example, in in my country, those of you who are living here already know that we are very fussy about garbage, you know, uh, recycling. When you throw your garbage, you know, you cannot do it like you are doing in New York, you know. You have to be very, <laughs> sort out everything, you know. So I don't want to do that in Korea. But anyway, um, when we first started that, probably people uh, came along because they didn't want to pay penalty, for example. But by now, people's awareness on this issue, the need for recycling uh, is, uh, I think, greater than any average country. So in that sense, you need inclusion on such a big issue. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to Yonsei University and having this opportunity for us young people to be exposed to this kind of discussions. My name is Ace and uh, I'm leading a student-led organization in Yonsei University called Student Climate Action Network, and which is devoted to the cause of stimulating discussion, reflection, and action among students, professors, and administration on the decarbonizing university campuses. My question to Mr. Zach is, do you have something like this in Columbia University where students are actively part in discussing climate change and planning out a climate action plan for decarbonizing campuses? Uh, we do, uh, and one issue that was uh, distinctive for Columbia, a number of uh, big American universities have endowments that have gifts that have been given to the university. And uh, uh, there's a movement in the United States by the students to insist that the universities don't invest anymore in fossil fuel. Uh, so our student group, uh, a couple of uh, last year, actually had a sit-in on the main building of the campus. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I thought what they did was great. The university leadership didn't think so much that it was great. But uh, they were protesting that the university is still investing in fossil fuel. Uh, and now the university has taken one step forward to get out of uh, certain parts, uh, coal in particular. I think they need to go much farther because basically these are lousy investments. If we're going to be climate safe, these are not good investments anymore. Uh, but yes, the students are active. One thing I would really encourage is think about a plan for Korea that's very ambitious, that really decarbonizes. What should it be? What would be realistic? How could it be done? Uh, can it be done within the country's own resources? Should it be linked? Uh, with the, with the rest of the region? What, would the re what about nuclear power? What's the, should that be not part of uh, this at all? Those are choices that really are pivotal. But I would say, how could Korea be carbon-free in energy system by 2050 is a really difficult, complicated, major challenge. And if, the students put forward a serious plan, it would get a lot of, lot of attention. Jeff? Yeah. Can I also say, 
when I, I called universities uh, little cities. Uh, universities, like John say, are not little cities. They're good-sized cities. Um, we have to walk the walk, and that's on everything. That's everything from recycling, as Ambassador uh, O mentioned, uh, the, uh, just getting used to recycling. At my university, the students uh, initiated through our uh, Sustainability Council uh, initiatives from, uh, they, they literally made us create trash cans that are this size. You don't get a big trash can the way you used to. Your office has this tiny trash can, and on it it says, there is no away. You can't throw something away, because there is no away. Um, you have to recycle. Um, it, the students were central in lobbying for the university to change its policy on, uh, on mass transit. And we now have a mass transit uh, new um, uh, metro line coming to the university in, in three years' time uh, after years of opposing it. Um, so at every level, the students used their participation in the, in the governance mechanisms of the university uh, to push the pace. And as Jeff said, the students are always ahead of the administration, and I'm an administrator. Um, I don't mind being pushed. In fact, I want to be pushed. Uh, so I think you can, you can push, uh, lay out a plan, uh, go from the investing to the recycling to the uh, the changing, changeover of the energy you use on campus uh, to the temperature at which you keep your buildings. Uh, all of those things can be done and it, it changes the mindset very quickly. In two to three years, students cycle through, uh, you can actually have uh, everyone agreeing to all these new things when at first everyone resisted. All of a sudden the new people come on campus and that's just the way it is. So keep pushing. Uh, all right, we have time for just one more, I'm afraid. Uh, and please, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a doctor from China. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'm a doctor from China, and now I'm a visiting doctor in RSM Medical Center. And I'm not going to, uh, first I want to say I have no financial relationship with Alibaba. I just want to introduce uh, some uh, green uh, economy things in China. Uh, because uh, You know, Alipay is very popular in China, not because it's very convenient. Uh, it also has some, uh, some tricks to attract consumers or customers. Why? Uh, if we pay the Alipay for bus or for subways, we will get a certain score. And if, if the score reach a certain number, so Alibaba will grow a real tree in the desert in, in the Mongolia. And by that way, both uh, we can, as a non-cash way, reduce the carbon, uh, carbon, emission, uh, uh, carbon volume, and the, uh, the trees there can absorb the carbon. And both the dust in, in the Mongolia become stable. So that's, I think that's a really good idea for the sustainable de development. So uh, I think besides, uh, uh, besides the talk uh, for the nuclear medicine of uh, petrols, it seems very, quite far from the individuals. But you, you know, now 200 million Chinese are using Alipay. And by uh, getting their numbers uh, by, the, by, by, the, by, by themselves, so I think it's a new way, it's a new idea for the uh, green energy, green economy. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you for that. Uh, Frank, do you wanna say? Yeah. Uh, I'd love to because it's partly do something you invited me to do I didn't and speak about agriculture and trees. Uh, we, we tend when we speak about climate change particularly to almost speak exclusively about energy and transportation and we've done that so successfully that, in fact, the area that is also very big that we haven't discussed very much, agriculture, is going to stand out as an ever bigger sore thumb if we don't also take action. And that is partly having climate smart agriculture in the field, but when I say agriculture, I really mean food systems, all the way from 
the farm to the fork, you know, and that just like recycling is a lifestyle choice, uh, agriculture and food is very much a lifestyle choice as well. You know, we may not be able to eat as much meat as we do. We may not be able to have as much processed food, which is anyway not very good for your health. And you know, I just heard, for instance, the good side about recycling in Korea, which is absolutely true, but I can't resist by saying, but I've also never been in a country where there is such an incredible amount of irresistible packaging. Wherever you go, you get pushed plastic packaging, including many plastic bags you absolutely don't want. So there's a lot of lifestyle choices that we have to make, many of which we aren't really aware of. What we use, what we eat, uh, and so on. And I'm entirely in agreement with you that we can vote with our feet as consumers, if you like, and then we have a lot of choices uh, to show those companies what it is that we really care about. Thank you. Keep your applause up. Join me in thanking this wonderful panel.